Let's give Jesus some praise in this place. Stay standing. Stay standing. Let's give Jesus some praise in this place. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, Grace Rev. Remember, we're changing things up, right? So we're going to stay standing. We're going to read the Word of God. And then we're going to get it on. All right. Amen. Thank you, John. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to have you in worship this morning. It's awesome. So we're talking about Elijah, right? We're in our second week of our sermon series titled, just simply titled Elijah. Um, Last week, we talked about God in his preparation of Elijah for a great mission, a great calling. Right, We talked about he sent him to this place where he was going to be alone, and God had some working to do on him, right? And, and so, you know, there was just all this stuff going on, and, and Elijah had, had announced basically an economic shutdown to Israel at this time, right? He told them that there would be no rain in Israel until further notice. Okay, and that means, in this day and age, that means an economic shutdown because everything that had to do with, with money and resources and prosperity and, in, you know, everything in, the, in this time had to do with crops, agriculture, uh, livestock. And without any rain, all that stuff dies, right? And so today we're going to move approximately... Around three years later, so Elijah's been in hiding for three years, right? So I think God wants to teach us something in that in that alone, that sometimes when, when God is calling us to do something, he's not just going to strike down a lightning bolt and you're going to figure it out. I wish it was that easy, Right? But sometimes we've got to go through some preparation. Sometimes we've got to go through some stretching. Sometimes we've got to go through some, some uncomfortability. Sometimes we've got to go through some pain in order for God to, to really be able to prepare us for a calling that only He can call us to. So I want to read to you. In Last week we was in 1 Kings 17. Today we're in 1 Kings 18. Uh, I want to read to you chapter, six, chapter 18, verse 16 through 21. So Obadiah, let me catch you up. Let me catch you up. So Elijah had been in this time. He'd been in this time of period or in this time of, of preparation. And so God told him, okay, Elijah, now you're ready. You need to go and you need to talk to this King Ahab, this sinful, wretched king. And so he sent Obadiah a guy who had followed the Lord, but yet he worked for King Ahab. So Obadiah went to meet, let's pick it up in verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, troubler of Israel? Right? You're the reason why all this bad stuff is happening. Elijah says, I I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, So Elijah, in this time of preparation, has really gained some momentum in his faith, right? Really gained some momentum in his relationship with God. Because he's not only talking to 450 prophets of Baal, but also there's 400 prophets of Asherah. So he's talking to 850 people just in prophets alone, not counting all the other people that's hanging out. So Elijah went before the people and said, 
How long will you waver between two opinions? Hmm. If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal is God, follow Him. But the people said nothing. They just stood there. Right? So the title of my talk today is, Which God do you serve? Which God do you serve? Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for this day. God, we praise you for your presence here in this place with us. God, I pray over that one person. Maybe it's more. I hope it's more. That walk through the doors of your house today. Seeking a deeper relationship with you, God. Seeking a revelation in their life, God, from you. Not from anybody else, but from you, the one true God. Father, I pray that you would reveal that. God, I pray your comfort and peace over our anxiety. I pray your comfort and peace over our culture. And Father, I pray that you would just use us in a mighty and powerful way. Whether that be just to share your love with another person or whether it would be to change the world one life at a time. In Jesus' name, and we all said, Amen. Amen. Now you may be seated. That's not too long to stand, is it? I didn't have nobody say no. That's all right. Y'all be all right. Okay. So like I said, as we learned last week, God, was, God had put Elijah through some seasons of preparation in order to use him in a, in a greater way to bring glory to God, right? So, Elijah had been in hiding, hiding for quite some time. So, after his preparation, now God wants him to go face off this evil king. I want to get right to it this morning. I want to get right into the Texas Roadhouse prime rib. No appetizers, no french fries. No mashed taters and gravy. We're going to jump right into the meat. Is that okay? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. I want to talk about three different topics or three different things that I think God wants us to learn from this confrontation between Elijah and this evil king. And the first thing I want to talk about this morning is don't blame God. What's the first thing Ahab did? He blamed God. Is that you, Elijah, the troubler of Israel? He wasn't owning his wrongs. He wasn't owning the things that they had done to put themselves in that situation. But yet he was blaming God because what they were following, what they wanted to know, what they wanted to like, didn't line up with God. So it's a bad thing. See, there's many times in our life where God will put us through preparation. There's many times in our life where God, where God will, will have us going through something and it's uncomfortable. Right? Sometimes life is uncomfortable. Sometimes it's painful. But yet we have to understand that, 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 that if we're following God, there's always a purpose for whatever we're going through. See, instead of... With our mindset, sometimes instead of persevering through and trusting God and believing in God, and God, this sucks right now, but you know what? I'm going to keep moving. We live a life of defense, right? As believers in Jesus Christ, we have to live a life of offense, a life of victory. Our perspective can't be on the negative, our perspective needs to be on the positive of what God might be doing in us. Sometimes when God doesn't answer your prayers, He's protecting you. See, 
What Elijah didn't realize when he was in Kirith Ravine and, 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 and he was laying there all by himself for three years and, and every day a raven would bring him breakfast and then every night a raven would bring him dinner. He didn't realize that God was protecting him. See, Ahab had been looking for him for a long time. And if he would have found him, he would have killed him. So through this preparation... God was protecting Elijah. We got to understand, church, that sometimes when we're in preparation and life's not going quite how we think it should or quite how we want, that God is protecting us. Amen. Right? I know, it sounds weird. <laughs> it goes exactly, it goes exactly what our culture tells us and teaches us. But praise God, our God is not a God of our culture. Right. I've heard people, I just want to give you a few examples. I've heard people blame God for, for temptation. Right? Maybe you're in a, in a pretty negative place in your life right now. Maybe you're even borderline depressed. Maybe you are depressed. So my question to, to you is, who do you have speaking into your life? Who are you sharing this with? Is it other negative people? Because if you're surrounded by negativity, then you're going to be negative. If you're surrounded by people that's all poor, poor me, you're going to stay in poor, poor me. But if you're surrounded... See, when I, I... You know what? I get in that situation too, man. I mean, ministry ain't always easy. You know, and, and I see, sometimes I see more defeats than I see victories. And it gets, it's like, man, what the heck am I even doing this for? Right? That's when I need to get on the phone and I need to call somebody who's going to speak some positivity into my life. Amen. Right? I need, to, I, need to, I need to talk to somebody that's going to say, hey, man, you know what? One, one, one life for Jesus is worth everything. Yeah. Keep going. Don't quit. Right? But... I've also heard people who struggle with addiction. I, I actually, this is an, actually an example that happened. Um, I was talking to this dude and he's like, man, he said, God has been testing me like crazy lately. Okay, I'm, I believe God will test you. I believe he'll test your faith. But then he said, man, I was at work the other day. and After work, all the guys went out back and they, they popped, they, you know, they were popping beers and drinking and, and, and smoking weed and, 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 and I was just standing there. <laughs> Leave! <laughs> Fool! God will not tempt you like that. That is a sin. God cannot sin. That is the devil trying to drag you back into a life-threatening addiction. God will not test you like that. He will not put you in a place and test you against, with a temptation against something that's going to kill you. You don't believe me. Okay, check this out. Check this out. This is the only time we're leaving 1 Kings 18 today, but I thought it necessary. James chapter 1, verse 13 through 15. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. God does not tempt you to sin. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Damn, amen. Then, after desire has conceived, so after you've been thinking about it, after you've been just marinating on it, it gives birth to sin. So once you've thought about it long enough, you're just going to go ahead and say, oh, what the heck, and give in. When it's full grown, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. God will not tempt you to sin. We cannot blame God 
for some situations that we physically put ourselves into by our own choices. Ahab chose to live this way. Ahab chose to worship the God of Baal. If any of you have ever seen, I'm gonna, I, because some of you are like, what the heck is God of Baal? Okay, so if you've seen, most of us have seen the Ten Commandments, if you haven't. When Moses comes down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments, all the Israelites are out there and they're just going nuts, right, in a bad way. And they've got this big golden cow on this trailer. Baal is the golden cow. Okay, that's, that's this God. And it represents strength and fertility as well as um, reflecting lust for power and sexual pleasure. Right? This God of Baal is a God of momentary pleasure. What God will you serve? Are you going to serve a God of momentary pleasure are you, or are you going to serve the God that loves you so much that He gave everything for you? <laughs> Elijah's God, our God, is the God of life that has no end. The, the, the God of eternity, right? A God of triumph, the God of victories. A God of endless opportunities we got to quit cutting ourselves short by following momentary pleasure. You're robbing yourself of what God really wants to do in your life. God's got more for you. Way more. Tell three people, God's got more. God's got more, man. We serve an everlasting, all-providing God. Second thing I want to talk to you about is a question that explains what we just talked about in a little bit more detail. The question is, how long are you going to waver? How long are you going to waver? How long are you going to waver back and forth? How long are you going to have one foot in heaven and one foot in hell? Scripture says that it is better to know nothing at all than it is to know the truth and not follow it. See, Elijah just prophesied to this king, either God is or he isn't. Verse 20 and 21. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? Between the truth and between a lie. How long are you going to waver? If the Lord is God, follow Him. If Baal is God, follow Him. Just make up your mind and follow one of them. Right? How are some ways that we waver? I've got a couple of examples. and Some of this is hard to hear, and, and I, I know I've already kind of got you guys a little bit and it's going to just get a little bit more right now um, but I just have to I just have to tell you man as your pastor who loves you who wants you to just flourish in the kingdom of God and, and I want the best for you just like God does I have to tell you some truth you know yes I love for you to come in here and for me to inspire you and God to inspire you through his word yeah go out and be world changers man <laughs> Go ahead and do this, man. Go do it for the Lord, man. But sometimes we have to talk about the truth. Sometimes we got to look at some problems and face them. And we got to do, some, do something to change what's going on. 
So one of the ways that we waver, I've seen people do this, and that's why I'm using it as an example, is, is through a relationship. Instead of waiting on God for a, for a God-honoring relationship, we settle for a relationship of lust and pleasure. That's serving Ahab's God. That's serving the God of Baal. Have you ever thought that maybe in this waiting that God is preparing you for someone? I know it's tough. I mean, I, I, I have people that's near and dear to me who are single and I know without a doubt that they would love to have that, that relationship. That's what we all strive for, right? Right? I've seen people on fire for Jesus. God is moving mountains in their life. And said person finds a boyfriend or a girlfriend and bam, God falls off the radar. And then when everything goes south, we blame God. God, why'd you take that relationship from me? God didn't take it away. Why? Because He didn't give it. I know some people who, who call themselves Christians, professed believers in Jesus Christ, and they are living on the fence. If you are on the fence, it means only one thing. You're totally lost. You're not following anything. Right? That's what Elijah said. He said, figure one of them out and follow that. I've also heard people... <laughs> I've had some people, I've had a guy, I've had a person tell me, oh, pastor, I'm just in a season, I'm just in a season of coasting right now. <laughs> that has got to be the dumbest thing I ever heard. Which way you got to be doing, going to coast? You can't coast like that. You can't coast like that. You got to be coasting like that. <laughs> if you're coasting, you're getting a little bit closer to hell. That's all I got to say. Yeah, you feel the temperature getting warmer. I know why. See, the great thing about what Elijah is doing in this time with this region, with, with these people, is he, he, he's not demanding perfection. Neither am I. I fall short. I mean, if you put a list down, I'm probably going to check half the boxes. And the good news that I have for you today is, is I don't think God demands perfection from us either. But we have to quit this back and forth mentality. We have to quit stepping into the world and stepping back into God. Stepping into the world for pleasure. Stepping into God where I need help. Do one or the other. Elijah just told King Ahab and all these people, y'all been a wretch for a long time. You've led people away from me. You've lived a, you lived a life full of lust and sin and wretchedness and serving self, but God's grace and forgiveness is still available to you when you repent to God and receive His forgiveness and His redemption. No matter where we've been, no matter how far we've strayed, God's grace is still available. If we will repent, Turn away from and follow God. 
The third thing I want to talk to you about is a little bit lighter. Okay? Everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> Tell your neighbor, man, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> Yeah. You think it's hard. It's hard for me standing up here preaching you, telling you what to do, knowing I struggle with the same thing. That's hard. <laughs> Number three. God is who He says He is. Right. He is who He says He is, and He will do what He says He'll do. I don't usually do this, but I'm going to read you, and it's not even going to be on the screens because it's, it's quite a bit. I'm going to read you verse 22 through 39 because I don't want it on the screens. I want you to focus on what the Lord might be telling you. So Elijah had just told all the prophets, how long are you going to waver? You know, either Lord, either, either the Lord is God or Baal's God. Pick, your, pick, your, pick, pick the one and follow. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Okay? So he was just telling them, go get two, two bulls. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on wood but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. He is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. So they, they still believe in their prophet. They think that when they call down fire, it's gonna, it's, they're going to have some steak. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. There's only one of me. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull, given them, and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. There was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. So they went from praying to dancing trying to get this dude to show up. See, and this is where I'm saying God doesn't demand perfection because I don't think Elijah in this next part I'm going to read to you I don't think that's really the way God wants us to 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 motivate or to to act but Elijah did it I think it's kind of funny I think you will too at noon Elijah began to taunt them shout louder he said surely he is a god Perhaps he's deep in thought, <laughs> or busy, or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. Somebody wake your God up. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as, were their, as, as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed. And they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him. And he repaired the, al repaired the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. 
With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two shays of seed. A shay of seed is about 24 pounds. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Right? He's like, I'm so confident. I want y'all to go get some water and pour it on mine. Do it again, he said. And they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered. And they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench that they had dug around it. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Man. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, burned up the wood, burned up the stones and the soil. And it also licked up the water in the trench. When all the, when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Amen? Amen? Amen. When God calls you to do something, He will provide everything needed to do it. Amen. When you're walking in His vision, He will automatically give you provision. Amen. Maybe not exactly when you think it should come, but He will pull it up and He will provide it exactly when it's needed. I'm sure Elijah would have loved to have a bull on a stake on an altar when he was in Kirith Ravine for those three years, eating whatever them stinking ravens brought him. But he waited. And when it was time, God showed up. Elijah challenged the people to take a stand for the one true real God. It is vitally important for us, church, to take a stand for our God. Okay, if we say one thing and people see us acting another, that's not taking a stand for our God. We cannot follow sin because it's popular or fun or because you're afraid someone might judge you or criticize you because you stand for the truth. If we continue drifting along with whatever is pleasant and easy, we will someday discover that we have been worshiping a false god all along. The false god of self. The false god of self. God flashed fire from heaven for Elijah. He will also help us accomplish what He commands us to do. The proof of God to us may not be as dramatic or as instant as it was for Elijah. God, I call in the name of the Lord. I need a husband right now. And He comes down from heaven. He might. You can try it. But I promise you, God will make resources available to us in a creative way to accomplish His purpose through us. Amen. He will give us wisdom to raise our families responsibly. Amen. He will give us the courage needed to stand up for what's true. Right. He will give us whatever we need to help someone else that's in need. God will always fulfill the goodness of His promise. 
Always. Just like Elijah. We can have faith that whatever, whatever God commands us to do, He will provide whatever's needed to carry it through. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray.